Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beyonce and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm so fired up tonight because I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by just not one Hall of Famer and my co-host, Steve Flink, but also a second Hall of Famer who was the youngest U.S. Open female singles champion in history, winning the title at just the age of 16 years old and the youngest inductee into the International Tennis Hall of Fame at the age of 29. You now see her on Tennis Channel doing such great commentary. Please welcome to the pod, Tracy Austin. Tracy, thank you for taking time out of your day and uh, speaking with both Steve and myself. Absolutely. Good to see you guys. So, hey, I, I, I'm, I was doing my research, right? And there's so much just I know because of your celebrity status, but I was digging some things up and I don't know if Steve was aware of this, but fun fact, you're, you were the very first opponent for Steffi Graf, a match you won 646 Love back in Stuttgart in 1982. Is that right? That is right. So I believe Steffi was 14 years old. She was the wild card at Stuttgart. I had won it a few times already. I was, you know, two or three in the world. And you're playing a, a German wild card that you know nothing about. And she comes out this skinny little girl with blonde hair wearing shorts and the forehand, the power off the forehand was extreme. She had a pretty good serve at that time. Obviously it got, it got better. She was only 14 at the time, but the forehand. Hey, Trace, was- I, I think she actually was 13 cause she was born in 69. So she was even younger than you thought. Wow. I don't think so. See, <laughs> I think she, I, well, it was October. So it was maybe, it, maybe, maybe you played her the next year then. Cause if it was in 82, Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. either way, she was very young and she was very good. And I think it got to four all. And then I, I won the last eight games. But, uh, you know, you definitely knew that she had she had talent. I had never heard of her before. At the time, we didn't have as much social media. And uh, so I, it was definitely difficult at the beginning to play her. But uh, it was interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you if there was any buzz um, that you had heard about her, but you kind of answered that and you said, not really. But when you started hitting with her, you could see uh, that forehand was something else and it just got better over time. Yes, absolutely. It got better over time. It really did. Yes, it did. Yeah, but did you think then, Tracy, did did you have it? Were you thinking about her future at all or this just was another dynamic young kid with a great forehand and you hadn't made up your mind yet about her future? Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting that you asked, because obviously the Germans wanted to know what I thought. Uh, I, I thought she was very talented, but it's it's so hard when, to take one match and predict someone's future. If we're all able to do that, we would go to Vegas. Right. So obviously there was talent, but I and it's interesting over the over the years, because there's many players that I thought were going to be Grand Slam champions or make it into the top 20 that didn't make it and, and vice versa, but without a doubt, she was impressive. It's not just the first tournament, her first match. That's what was so crazy about that stat. Um, I, I want to hit on a couple of things because there were some big, big news uh, flashes this week. And we'll start with, with uh, two of the big three, then we'll go to Novak as well. But first um, I wanted to ask you about Roger, obviously he pulled out of Toronto and Cincinnati you know, we just turned 40 and then we heard from himself. Uh, what was it on Sunday? I believe we're recording this on Friday that he needs another surgery to be away from the tour for months is what he said. I, I guess I'm curious of both of you. We'll start with Tracy first, your initial reaction. And, and two, do you think we'll see him back in 2022 um, being competitive and getting into late rounds of, of tournaments? You know, I don't know. I, I, I never want to bet against Roger. I do know that when I was over at Wimbledon this year and I saw him lose to her coach, I actually took a picture when he walked off the court because I somehow felt that that might be the last time that, that we see Roger. I didn't know that, as he said five days ago, he further hurt his knee and he's going to have to have a fourth surgery. There's little things that he says, like there's a glimmer of hope for the future. I, I didn't really love that line from him. Also, he talked about that the fact that I, you know, I want to be able to move around later. I guess he's insinuating he wants to play tennis. He wants to be active. He's got four kids that he, that he wants to run around with. And he said something about the fact that father or something with, that he's 40 now and it's, it's going to be more difficult 
with another surgery and taking so many months off. He only played one tournament in 2020. He played five this year. He really barely made it through the Manorino match the first round. That was tough to watch because he was looked so rusty. Manorino ended ended up getting uh, getting hurt. So it would kill me if, if it's the last that we've seen of Roger, but it would not surprise me. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I, I pretty much in accord with Tracy's assessment. I I I I wondered a bit. I I still think though, Tracy, that there's this part of him that cannot resist trying again. That the injury will not beat him, he will try again, and also accept the consequences if the results are not that great. So if he played a few tournaments next year and he wasn't getting anywhere, and then especially if the knee starts to bother him again, uh, then I think he's going to realize I've had three surgeries. I've got to let this go because. I just got to think of my health the rest of my life and let the career go. But I, I just think there's a part of him that doesn't want to let go on. on and plus that it's what Tracy was talking about with her cush. That was a quarterfinal. I mean, yes, he could have been out in the first round, but somehow he made it to the quarters and, and nobody, that was an astounding accomplishment in, in itself. So I think, I think uh, we may see a few more tournaments out of him next year in the spring, but perhaps not make it back to Wimbledon. Let's hope so. So that, let's hit on the next uh, of the big three, and that's Rafael Nadal. Couldn't train for around 20 days after the French Open. Saw him in D.C. Um, it was clear his foot was bothering him in his first match against Jack Sock. Rafa did get through that one. I think it was 7-6 in the third. Um, was moving better in his next match, but lost to Lloyd Harris. He then pulls out of Toronto and Cincy. Uh, and today, again, we're recording this Friday, releasing it on Monday. Um, he makes the statement and he makes the video that he's uh, not only pulling out of the U S open, but he's also done for the rest of the year. Um, I guess I'll ask both of you similar things. What do you expect from, from Rafa in 2022? Tracy, we'll start with you again. Um, 2022. I, I hope that we see him at hundred percent. I found it interesting that in his statement, he talked about this is the same foot injury that's been bothering him since he was 19 years old. And the doctor at the time was pretty negative about it. He was very thankful for the career that he's had because it's been bothering him off and on. And how many times have all of us speculated about whether his knees were going to hold up or his feet were going to hold up or something because of the way he plays so physically. I had a hard time watching Rafa that first match that he came back against Jack Sock in DC because he was out for two and a half months. And when you come back after that long and you're playing your first match and it looked like the foot was really bothering him. He, he'd run like a deer. And then when he had to put the brakes on, it was like he was grimacing and it, he looked hindered. And, and you're just thinking, okay, this is hard courts. He's going to have to play DC. Is he going to play Toronto? Is he going to play Cincy? And then all of this leading up to the U S open where I'm sure he really wanted to play. You know, if this was September, I think he would have shut it down immediately. But the fact that he's got 20, Novak has 20. There's another major that he can play, and he's 35 now. So, you know, how many more can he play? He wants to play every one that he can. I just respect him so much that he made that effort. But it's, oh gosh, it was, it was, it was tough to see because I know a foot injury. You know, he has to move well. And uh, he, he looked in pain. And the other thing that was interesting is where he said, kind of admitted, I haven't been able to prepare like I wanted to. Basically, he's been playing all of these tournaments, even the French, with limited practice. That's very hard as an athlete and as a top athlete. That and He's a repetition preparing. type of guy. He's a repetition type of guy. He likes exactly. practices. He likes a lot. Yeah, of yeah. I mean, most, most people are maybe Roger less than others. But uh, that must have been really bothersome for him to, to be able to, to be hindered in that way. Steve, what are your thoughts on Rafa? Yeah, I, I watched it too. I, I had a similar reaction to Tracy watching the Jack Sock match because the, the wincing that Tracy is describing was happening after almost every point. Then the odd thing is when he lost to Harris, he didn't look as if he was in as much pain. And then I was actually encouraged by that because I thought, all right. Maybe he can go on to Toronto. Maybe he can turn the corner a little bit here. But then once, once he announced he was out of there and out of Cincinnati, I really didn't think we'd see him at the Open. And I, I just wasn't expecting that it would be shutting down for, for the rest of the year. But I see that as a move, Tracy, for him to prolong his career, that he's saying, look, I've got to let this year go. It's no point in playing tournaments in the fall. I'd like, I want to see if I can get ready for Australia next year and give this time to, 
to heal. And he's usually pretty wise these days about uh, stepping aside when he has to and giving himself time. When he was younger, he always wanted to play every tournament. So I, 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 I'm, I think he, he knows his body well, and he knows this injury well, and there's, there's a chance of some kind of a resurgence next year. And I'm fascinated to see what do. Yeah, I, I am. I, all three of us were. And again, just like with Roger, just like with Rafa, let's, let's hope they get healthy and let's see, let's hope we do see them back on the court in 2022. The last of the big three, uh, Novak Djokovic. Look, um, Steve and I had talked about this before, Tracy. When Novak won Wimbledon, both Steve and I did not think he would be going to the Olympics. We thought he would be save, you know, save everything up for the summer hardcourt swing, U.S. Open, gear up for that. He surprised Steve and myself. He did go to the Olympics. We give him credit for trying. He was cruising along those first few rounds and lost to uh, Sasha and then Pablo Carina Boos, the back-to-back. Um, do you think that's going to really refocus him uh, and, and lock, lock him in on, on this 2020 U.S. Open in a couple of weeks? Yes, without a doubt. I think that he's had enough time now because he hasn't played in between. And he knows, as you said, how to manage. These guys know how to manage their schedule and they know when they need to push it a little bit more, when they need to pull back, when they need more matches, when they feel fine. I've got to say, I was not surprised that he played the Olympics because the greatest ever is on the line. And can you imagine if he had gotten the golden slam this year and without Roger playing, without team playing, without Rafa playing the Olympics, I thought he was the clear favorite. He had just won Wimbledon. And I think the oppressive heat, I think um, playing the mixed probably wasn't a great idea. None, nobody on the Serbian team, including Troitsky, who was the captain, didn't want him to play. But, you know, again, how can you fault a guy that says, I wanted to play the mix because I wanted to try to win another right. medal for my country? I just think that that's a, a lot to be proud of. But I think with the conditions over there, playing those extra matches probably did hurt him. He was three games away in the final. He was a set. I think it was three all. And then he, you know, he seemed to collapse against Sasha and, and disappointed to, to lose that bronze medal as well. And then couldn't play, uh, you know, and when I hear people faulting him for pulling out of the mix, I have a hard time with that. People are always looking to poke and prod and, you know, how about look at the fact that the guy was, was trying to, to, to win. So I think that he's still going to win in New York. I, I really do. I think it's exciting for tennis to put us on the front page of newspapers and talk that, uh, this guy's won three. This is crazy. I think it's, Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the first time since Rod Labor in 69 that anybody's won the first three. So it's uh, exciting news, and, and, and I hope he gets it. I think we lost Steve for a minute, so hopefully he can come back, but I think you're right on that fact. It is the first okay. since Labor. He's calling me right now, but we'll try to get him back on, and we'll, we'll just continue on if that's okay, Tracy. Um, sure. After, after the big three, I do want to talk to you because you could really relate um, to the young players on tour. Um, I mean, what you were playing tournaments at 14 years old, you won the U.S. Open at 16. Coco Golf came on the scene at age 15. I, I think I'm the same age as Jennifer Capriati. She turned pro at 13. If you can talk about turning pro at such a young age, maybe some of the differences that, that you had to deal with versus some of the younger players today. Obviously, the biggest being there wasn't social media around at that time. I mean, that is, to me, there's a lot of good with social media, but there's also a lot of bad with it. And, and athletes and just famous people in general um, have to really kind of protect themselves from dealing with some really horrible, horrible things that um, can occur on social media. Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. I mean, what we had to deal with, I was uh, 14 when I came on the tour and it was the newspapers, it was magazine articles. And what I was told from the, right from the get-go was just don't read those because if you read them and they say great things and it's gonna blow your head up, if it's mean, then it's gonna to stick, to stick with you forever. If you're sensitive at all, which most 14 year olds are going through their teens. So I think social media, you can magnify all of that by a hundred times because you have people, if you read it now, again, I would tell young players growing up male or female not to read that because you have people that are, that are able to speak directly to you. Um, you know, if you read it um, and it, I just think that it, that it is, everything's examined way more. So what 
I tried to do was just focus on the task at hand. If I was going to win matches, all the endorsements would come, you know, focus on what's important. And that's trying to become a better tennis player, trying to win matches, managing your time, therefore your team, your family, really important to have people that have the same goals for you, long-term goals as you for a tennis player, but also for a person. But I, I do feel for, for these people because I can tell you what, I still remember some of the things that was all years ago that, that people said in newspapers. It just gets stuck in there, right? Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't go away. So also for press conferences, I can remember sometimes holding back. You say a few things, you get burned, and then you say, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to be quite as honest. I'll hold it closer to my, to my vest because, because they burn me. All good points. Yeah. I mean, and again, it's so fun for these athletes to be able to interact with their fans through social media. But again, like you said, the downside of it, it's so easy for anyone to, to come on there and say whatever they want. There's no filter. And that's pretty dangerous when you get some, uh, crazy people out there. I think we say, <laughs> you could say safely, but yeah, um, crazy or just, you know, wanting to vent or, you know, whatever it is, there's, there's no shortage of opinions, right? Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. We're going to see if we can get Steve back in here real quick. Um, I, I did want to end, and I know you're, you're a tennis parent. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you and Brandon, one of your sons, a tremendous career, a, a USC all American. Um, I'm a huge fan of junior and college tennis. When I started this pod, I had a lot of really good, um, college coaches on the pod. The issue I want to ask you, and it's talked about quite a bit is the cheating that goes on in junior tennis. And, you know, in college, a lot, a lot of the matches in college, at least you have a chair umpire, but in the juniors, other than Kalamazoo and maybe a couple odd things, you really don't have anybody on that court. And, and one thing that I've been told by a few um, college kids, which really disturbs me is that sometimes in college, when a, when a ball is short, it's a big point and you can't get to it. And it's somewhat close. Just call it out and depend on the umpire to overrule it. I mean, that is it college that, kids tell you that, or did the coaches tell the college kids to do that? Kids are telling me that coaches have told kids yeah. to do that. Um, yeah. and that to me ethically, um, is, is so, so poor. Um, but I think, I, I I think if we can take it, tennis is such a unique sport in that. I mean, can you imagine like a baseball player uh, that the, the hitter calls its balls and strikes or a, a lineman in football calls, gets to call the holding penalty. I mean, I, what other sport is there that the participants itself call their own lines? Right. Um, there is the honor system. It's how you're raised. It's how you're coached. Cause I know there are so many, I, I want to be clear on this. There are so many great, ethically great college coaches out there and junior coaches out there. And there's a few bad apples in, in every industry. I want to make that right. clear. That's um, right. I want to emphasize there are great, great coaches out there. That said, you see it now, social media, the cameras capture everything. And the bad calls don't happen at, at two, one in the first set. They happen at, at four, four in, in the third set on a no ad point. Um, what are your thoughts on it and how do we correct it? <laughs> yeah. This is such a, an interesting subject because I grew up in junior tennis and I don't remember it being this bad. I think it's without a doubt gotten worse since, since I grew up and to see what Brandon went through, whether it was, you know, a dad every single time bringing the thermos on after three or five games, which is totally illegal and speaking in a foreign language. And I'm saying, you can't do that. You can't go on court. Well, I need to deliver the, the thermos and then going on, I'm saying, well, you can't speak in a foreign language. Well, I just did. And you don't know what I said. Well, precisely. That's why you're not allowed to do it. And it was, it was nonstop. That's why my husband, Scott, actually asked to be on the grievance committee in, in Southern California, because he was just so tired of it. He was up to here, bad actors, parents, clearly, I believe, condoning it. Because if your kid is 13 and 14 years old and still cheating, well, the parents have obviously not told them that they can't continue to be repeat offenders. So it's uh, very hard. There's a couple of things that possibly could be done, maybe pay a little more for your entry fee so that there could be more roving umpires, just the threat of somebody being around overruling you. There could be the threat of a point system with 
you know, if Johnny or Susie gets so many uh, times that uh, somebody is called on court, they add up those points and they get dinged. They miss a month, they miss some tournaments, whatever it is, because there has to be consequences for to change um, the outcome of, of these situations. And then in college tennis, I found PlaySite to be very helpful, but yeah. not every college can, can afford PlaySite. But the calls, like you said, were shocking. I mean, clearly that's why they changed the lets in the, the men's tennis, because there were so many lets being called when a person was getting ace, oh, let. So they actually had to change the rule completely and play let. So it is unfortunate. I've heard of coaches that have said, you know, if you're not, if you're not getting overruled enough, then you're not trying hard enough, like you said. Mm -hmm. But that being said, 90 Eight percent of the coaches are absolutely fantastic. It kills me when you see a coach let something slip through when they clearly know that it was that it was a bad call. But overall, I think we should stay positive. Yeah, no, no, no. I, tennis, but it's those bad actors that, and you know what? Everybody knows who has the bad reputation. They that's know what I was going to say, Tracy. So, actor. like, you know who you know that reputation. You know, especially in a junior tournament. You could say, hey, I'm going to get a lines person, you know, after the first point, right? Just so we don't deal with it. But there's just not enough people out there. There's uh, not enough they stay financial. For two games. They stay for two games. That's all they can yeah. do. And then they have to go to the next court. Right. Um, well, I just wanted to hear your thought. But again, look, tennis is a unique sport. It's a great sport. 98% of the time, it's perfect. But, it is, or, you know, there's bad apples, like I said, in every industry. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on, if, you know, any suggestions of, um, how to correct it. Um, but again, the sad being part raised, about it though is how many kids do we lose because of yes. that? That's so, right. I and I don't think you can, I, I don't know how you can get that stat, but there's a lot of kids that you're going to ruin it because they'll go to another sport where there is officials on every court. Um, yeah. And they're and enjoying that's themselves. Sad. You know, tennis is already tough enough as an individual sport. <laughs> and then you're a 10 year old and you have to call your own lines and you feel like the other kids cheating you there's a lot going on and so they sometimes gravitate towards the team sports yeah steve I'm, i mean i know you've covered yeah, the sport professionally thing, for a long time but um i i was curious if you had any thoughts on this as well no i mean i i, I i'm i'm taking it all in but what i'm wondering is tracy you you go out to those matches and you're watching your son play which is hard enough and then <laughs> what about what about the other parents how did they do mo are most of them aware of who you are or are some of them so young that they don't know who you are? I mean, I'm just wondering how that play you're in a tough position because you, you have some fame and you have had this great success as a player and here you are raising a, your kids. How does that play out? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I tried to have a, a low profile, but there was uh, one match. I remember when Brandon was playing is about 10 and the dad continued to yell out and give advice and coach and I said, you know, you're really not allowed to coach. And he said, well, who do you think you are, Tracy Austin? And I said, oh, <laughs> no actually, way. Actually, I am. And therefore, I know you're not allowed to coach. And he continued <laughs> to coach. So there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, Steve, I know, we, I know we lost you for um, technical difficulties for about five minutes. Before we um, wrap up, is there anything else you want to, um, you know, Ask Tracy about. I know we got the U.S. Open a couple of weeks away. I was just in Cincinnati. Um, I watched a lot of the women practicing. Just a couple quick thoughts, and and Steve and Tracy, please chime in. Um, watching Ash Barty, she was playing with Madison Keys. She was practicing with Madison Keys, and then she was practicing with Simona Halep. Um, all three so likable, um, interacting with each other on the court, interacting with the fans, so good. The other person, and I, I know I, I've seen on TV, but I had not seen Jen Brady um, play in person, and I saw her practicing. She hits the cover off the ball. I, I mean, harder than Ash, harder than Madison, and Maddie hits hard, um, harder than Simona. She was, you know, killing the crap out of the ball. And again, it was fun to watch her, great energy on the practice court. Um, I think Jen, I mean, we all know on hard court, she's great. What she made the semis in 2020 at the open. She made the finals of Australia. Um, if she's healthy, she just had to withdraw from Cincy with her knee. I, I hope she makes a deep, deep run in New York. That's going to be tough to do. It's a quick turnaround from since I hope she heals in time. I hope it's enough time that over the next week it gets better. And 
because after the way she played that great match, Tracy, against Os Osaka in the semis last year, one of the best matches of the year, I thought. Yeah. And then uh, wasn't able to push her as hard in Australia, but still, she is great on hard courts, and you'd like to see her right in the thick of things. Yeah, what's interesting about the women's game right now is I actually just came back from Montreal called the whole week uh, uh, up there for the Canadian Open. And there are so many women that could win the U.S. Open. I, I was just looking at, at the draw in Cincinnati and, and the upsets. Paula Badosa is playing amazing. She could go really deep. I could give you 12, 15 names. Sloan has struggled uh, this spring, seems to be getting better actually has lost early in the last couple of tournaments. But if she went and won it, I, I wouldn't surprise me. Petra Kvitova had to retire today. She wasn't feeling well. Ash Barty could win it. Coco she's, Goff. She's playing unbelievable. Ash she, Barty's playing unbelievable. Right? He is. <laughs> like Coco Goff could win it. So again, women's tennis, throw the balls up and whoever executes on that day. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and on the men's side, we're starting to see the next generation come through with Sitsipas, who, who lost in the finals to Djokovic and Medvedev lost in the Australian finals. So they're starting to make some deeper runs with, with the, some of these other guys, the older guys, even team out. Uh, I just find it fascinating. I'm very looking very much forward to it. I also think with the women, because they see that anybody can win on a, on a given day or a given week, it gives them hope. Why not me? Yeah. I think it's fantastic. That's a good point. Um, look, before I go, we're, we're going to, we're recording this on Friday. We're going to release it Monday. Um, it's going to be before the U S open. So I guess I'll have both of you on record. Um, I'll even, I'll give my prediction at the end too, is uh, we'll start with uh, Tracy here. Is Novak going to, going to win it? He is. I think he's going to win it. I think he's so good in the big moments and he's had enough time off. Now he's going to be fresh. He seems to handle the pressure because there are going to be a lot of eyeballs on him. He's going to win it. And then I think on the women's side, hmm, I'm going to go with Ash Barty. She seems to be playing great. Good picks there. Steve, how I, about you? Well, I, you know, I'm a little annoyed with Tracy right now. <laughs> it's times I ever have been because I was hoping that she wouldn't say Ash Barty so that I could. Because <laughs> I do. I, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Great minds I, can think alike, Steve. Great no, minds I'm, can I'm, think alike. I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I, I, I like Ash Barty's chances. And, and uh, she, I think, is growing into becoming a, a better and better big match player. And I, I like the way she handled the pressure in the Wimbledon final against Pliskova and I, I definitely like Novak's chances. I think the only thing that could thwart him is if the, if he complained about, a, he said he had a bunch of injuries, Tracy, at the end of the Olympics. He, he didn't say one, it was the shoulder, but he said there were other things. Hopefully all those things were relatively minor and he did, he was very wise not to jump into Cincinnati. So he gave himself plenty of time. And then I'm thinking he probably uses those early rounds to really start to peak and then I do like him down the stretch and it is best of five and not best of three, which is another advantage for him. And I also think he, he senses this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, uh, he, he's had three major years before, but to, to, to have those thir first three in his pocket, I mean, you just, even if he had a couple of great years to follow this one, you can't expect to be back in this position again. He, he understands that. And I think he's going to let that work in his favor. That's a very good point. Can I just chime in there? That's such a good point, Steve, because that once in a lifetime opportunity, it's kind of like the Olympians every four years. And I think Novak is actually going to rise to the occasion, be able to elevate because of that situation where so many others would feel the weight of that moment and not be able to handle it. So that's a good point. Yeah, it's absolutely. So it's and we've seen him. We've seen him, David and Tracy. We've seen him so many times in the big pressure moments. I mean, I'm, I honestly thought he was at about 81% when he played Roger in the 2019 Wimbledon final. If that, I, I didn't really think it was the best Djokovic at all, but every time after he lost a couple of decisive sets, the second and fourth, but all three sets he wins are in tiebreakers. He saves himself from double match point down. So I do, and I, I think he handled the pressure very well coming back against Tsitsipas in that French final, Tracy, and then again down a set against Berrettini and just got right down to business at Wimbledon. So I do... I do believe that the, the high pressure is something he he almost welcomes it. You know, he's so used to dealing with it now. And he didn't let it get to him at all, the first three. I don't think he was thinking about the slam one bit, even in the Wimbledon final. But now he will be. And, and I think that's going to be something that just inspires him. 
I will I will end with this. I, I will be consistent on, on the on the women's side. I'm gonna go with Ash Barty. She's been playing so so good right now. I would not be surprised if she won. I'm not gonna bet against her. A couple things on the men's side. Um I'm gonna go with actually Daniil Medvedev. He's had a uh, he's had a really, really good summer. Um he had a great summer in 2019, I believe. I thought he overplayed in 2019 going into the open. He didn't. He had that unbelievable final against Rafa. The other thing and and the difficulty of like what you're saying, this is a once in a lifetime thing. It was so hard for Novak to get the first three because the French, no one was getting the French other than Rafa. I think actually it may be a little bit easier going forward for Novak to get the first is actually the first two of the year. That French is the second, right? I think going forward, it may be a little easier for Novak to get the first two of the year depending on Rafa's health, right? Up until this point, Rafa was just a machine, basically. Um, so Novak never really had the choice. There was that one time in 2015, but he didn't win the Open when he beat Rafa on clay. Um, there may be a chance that, that Novak can get the first three again in a year. It may be a little bit easier going forward than it had been in the past. I hope I made myself clear there. Yes, he did. Oh, I get your point. I get your point. I just think that the odds are that he could be playing great next year and then maybe maybe he wins two of the three. Maybe maybe he doesn't happen to win Australia again, which has been his dominant major event. But I, I think he, he almost has to look at it that, look, I'm 34 now and I, I, I've got two or three great years ahead of me, but I've got to do this, take advantage of this opening now. But a good, interesting call on Medvedev David, I do think that it was, he was in a similar position in Australia, though. Medvedev had won the, that Paris one, Masters 1000 at the end of last year, then won the ATP finals in London, came to that Australian final looking very confident. Djokovic had been through all those physical woes, and then he yeah. beat some 5-2-2 five, five, two and two in the final. Well, I couldn't be exactly equal with both of you, but yeah, we were pretty close. Um, thank you both for your time. Obviously enjoyed, enjoyed this. You, you two are the best and I appreciate it and look forward to, to doing this again soon. Thanks, David. Yes. Thank you, David.